Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be, uh, uh, listenership and viewership, uh, uh, worldwide, uh, global context and framework and reference for the 30th annual Arab-US Policymakers Conference. I'm John Duke Anthony. I'm the president and CEO of the National Council on US-Arab Relations, uh, which has been the visionary and practitioner of these uh, one-of-a-kind annual forums that bring together serious foreign affairs practitioners from the Arab side and the American side uh, to try to emphasize the commonalities of our needs, of our concerns, of our interests, of our key foreign policy uh, objectives, not just national security by any means, but the economic ones, the commercial ones, the political ones, and above all, those pertaining to war and peace, conflict resolution, and problem solving, and decision making. Uh, we couldn't ask for a better chairperson of this session than His Excellency Dr. Abdullah Babu. <clears throat> Dr. Bahavuda is a native of Oman, uh, but has long been associated with the state of Qatar in terms of two aspects, the academic niche of Islamic area studies, but also previously the founding director of the Gulf Studies Program at the University of Qatar, uh, which all the way from the bachelor's, master's in doctoral level <clears throat> prepares students uh, for a lifetime of career uh, focus uh, on the six state GCC region of Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. To give you an idea of how much this individual is in demand as a consultant, as a briefer, as a researcher, as a writer, and especially a conference convener and interviewer, as you'll see momentarily, uh, Dr. Bob is presently a visiting professor at Waseda University in Tokyo, where he's just now finishing up a semester long course for Japanese students on the political economy uh, of the Gulf uh, region and its member uh, states. He's also been a, the former director of the annual Gulf research meetings at the University of Cambridge. Uh, there's no forum like this anywhere in the world that uh, under the leadership of Dr. Abdulaziz Asakar, uh, the founder of the Gulf Research uh, Center, uh, leading uh, specialists from all over the world convened in Cambridge for several days and roughly 10 different sessions, 10 different facets, forces and phenomena pertaining uh, to the overall Gulf region, in, including uh, Yemen and areas farther afield that impact on the Gulf and vice versa. Um, I invite you to uh, take into consideration uh, applying for acceptance and admission uh, to that particular annual vent venue. This year's was virtual, as was last year. We do not know when the pandemic will lift substantially to make it in person again. Uh, but what is embarrassing is that the U.S. representation at those meetings is, is so paltry, uh, seldom more than a dozen out of the 300 plus annual participants in that conference uh, are present. And the, there's a reason for this, uh, but it also is reflected on the lesser knowledge and understanding and information and insight and analyses of validity by North Americans in comparison with the European Union and member countries and those in Asia and elsewhere. Uh, Dr. Bob has also been a visiting professor director of the Middle East Institute at the National University of, of Singapore. He's uh, also uh, visiting professor, non-resident at the Hamid bin Khalifa University in, in Qatar, as well as in an ongoing uh, role uh, with the Gulf Research Center. Indeed, there's never been a single conference in Cambridge uh, where Dr. Baal Buddha 
has not had his fingerprints and footprints all over the organization and the choreography and the administration of that extraordinary one of a kind international forum. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Abdullah Baabuda, who's a native of Oman, uh, but has spent much of his, if not most of his academic research and publishing career abroad in other countries, all of which have been uh, extraordinarily fortunate to have him with them as we have been now for three years in succession uh, for this 30th anniversary of the annual Arab US Policymakers Conference. Dr. Abdullah. Dr. John Duke, thank you very much for this very kind and generous introduction. Uh, and what a pleasure to see you, albeit it's uh, online and virtually, and uh, I can tell you how much we miss being with you and your family and your friends and your colleagues at the National Council for US-Arab Relations. It goes without saying you have a wonderful team and you are doing a great job uh, for US-Arab uh, relations, which we congratulate you uh, on doing. And we really highly appreciate what you and your team and your colleagues are, uh, are doing. And uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure also, uh, and I really thank you for inviting me to moderate this session on the geopolitical dynamics of Arabia uh, and the Gulf, uh, which is uh, a session of the, your third, 30th annual uh, conference of um, uh, policy, uh, policy makers conference. Um, without much ado, I don't, uh, we have, it's, you know, it goes without saying that we have a distinguished, uh, a number of distinguished speakers who you have handpicked uh, to present at this, uh, at this session. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, for the first time, men are outnumbered, but it is a great uh, opportunity to see that, uh, you know, that gender is taking, uh, uh, is there is a reverse gender, uh, if you like, uh, uh, attack uh, on, on men because we have dominated, uh, uh, or men have dominated uh, the atmosphere for a long time. It's about time that women do that. Uh, so I welcome all the three female speakers uh, as well. And I also welcome my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Abdullah Shaiji, who uh, I will ask him, to, first of all, to give us like five or seven minutes max on what he sees uh, as the geopolitical dynamics uh, of Arabia and the Gulf. Well, Dr. thank Abdullah. you very much. I don't know if, uh, can you hear me? I'm, I'm yep, on. We can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and it really it gives me great pleasure once again for the second year in a row uh, uh, to be unfortunately through Zoom and uh, uh, far away from where we used to meet with uh, Dr. John Duke Anthony and his wonderful team and other uh, colleagues. Uh, this is the second year in a row and hopefully next year will be in, in person. If, uh, if uh, the pandemic really will, will be uh, over or almost over. Uh, first of all, uh, allow me, Dr. John Duke Anthony, to extend uh, my warmest uh, appreciation and thanks and congratulations uh, for your 30th anniversary, for your perseverance, and for your wonderful work as the bridge between our two uh, societies and our two regions. You've been doing great job and this, this should be recognized uh, by all, in my opinion. Uh, I'm really glad to be in, uh, in the presence of this distinguished panel. And as my friend Abdullah Babud stated, probably this is the first time women outnumber a man, the only uh, male participant in this panel. This is really strange. Usually it's the, it's the opposite, but uh, this is also, uh, something that uh, uh, will be remembered. Uh, because of the time limitation, uh, let me just uh, go over uh, telegraphic uh, uh, points that I'd like to raise. Uh, uh, we meet for the first time with uh, uh, the receding of the Gulf region. Uh, we have been successful for uh, uh, clearly over the last few months in 
vaccinating uh, about 70% of the population in Kuwait uh, and other Arab uh, or GCC countries also. Uh, it took its toll on us, uh, as you probably have been following on, on the whole world uh, community. Uh, the pandemic has really dealt a major blow to economic uh, uh, progress, economic growth, and uh, uh, you know, run a market uh, all over the uh, region. So, I'm glad to see that. Uh, there is an uh, regarding the issue. And the the, the uh, Qatar on one hand and the CC countries, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and see that the reconciliation has really come to a full circle. Yet, a lot of visits between the uh, high rank officials uh, to Doha, and uh, there was a meeting between also the uh, Amir of Qatar and the uh, vice president of UAE, things are moving in the right direction. And I've been an advocate of that, the zero sum game that we have witnessed over three and a half years of the major disruption of GCC relationship. Uh, what took its toll on the GCC as a, the vital and most prosperous and probably a role model for other Arab countries in the, in the Arab world to emulate. I mean, the center of gravity has shifted uh, very clearly uh, since the what, uh, what's uh, called the Arab Spring from the uh, center to the peripheries where the GCC states uh, have become the focal point and the center of gravity for the Arab political system. And uh, I'm glad to see uh, that what I have expected or anticipated uh, as a prophecy in my academic book that was one of the first Arab uh, uh, one of the first books in the uh, Arab language uh, discussing the GCC crisis uh, came to fruition by the reconciliation that was, uh, that was overdue. But uh, things have really also need to strategic fashion because the GCC still has not got, got its act together. We are seeing a lot of friction still in the region, and this needs to really be hammered out in a very professional fashion. Uh, the third point I'd like to raise is that the relationship with our neighbors, uh, the relationship with Iraq is really, uh, uh, we are witnessing what's going on in Iraq with a lot of apprehension. Uh, the election that took place was disputed by the losing parties that, were, uh, that are aligned with Iran. And that really causes a lot of concern for us that things could really go uh, spiral out of control in Iraq because of uh, uh, the, this dispute aided by and abated by, by Iran, which is still continue to wreak havoc by its shenanigans and intervention in the region. We have just busted uh, that was now accused, 18 of them now are in prison, accused of uh, funneling money to Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. So the shenanigans of Iran is going on unabated, and this also could uh, contribute to the instability in the region. The fourth point I'd like to raise is that there was a meeting yesterday in uh, the GCC uh, Secretary General between uh, uh, Mali, the U.S. envoy to Iran, and the uh, GCC uh, representatives, uh, and they talked about uh, preparation, probably briefing by uh, Mr. Mali regarding the upcoming seventh uh, round of meeting with the Iranians on the 29th of this month of November in Vienna. But the concern of the GCC, as it was uh, uh, clearly indicated by the uh, Secretary GCC Secretary General, Dr. Al Hajraf, just uh, less than an hour ago, uh, is not being heeded by United States. I was one of the, uh, uh, the first ones who advocated the, re uh, the, the need for not only five plus one, but five plus one plus one, 
uh, during the uh, discussion for the upcoming uh, Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action in 2014 and 2015, that uh, GCC concern not being taken into consideration. Not only we are fearful as the close neighbors of Iran of its shenanigans and it's a nuclear uh, pursuit of a nuclear weapon, but also uh, it's not uh, it's not less concerning for us the ins the uh, destabilizing behavior and escalating tendency by the Iranians to up the ante and to interfere in uh, the region's affairs, as we see with the Houthis, as we see with the uh, popular mobilization. Uh, uh, forces, as we see also with the rings that have been being busted 2015 uh, and on. The fear was that President uh, uh, Obama was concerned very much about his legacy, that he really allowed Iran to roam freely and drag havoc in the region, both that it has come to Damascus, Beirut, and Sana'a. Um, because, uh, because of that, he was not accommodating, uh, even though I give credit to President Obama, that he uh, transferred the GCC relation from bilateral relationship between the United States and each individual GCC country into a US GCC uh, uh, con condominium of relationship by hosting the first uh, USGCC summit in Camp David uh, back in May 2015. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Do you, do you, Professor uh, Shaiji, if you don't mind, uh, we've gone over the time. Um, uh, uh, if you give me one, one minute, Abdullah, please, I'll, I'll just close now. Very the, quick, please. The fear is that now with the with US withdrawal from Afghanistan and the what it left uh, in, uh, in the region, uh, plus President Biden is not re returning to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, not in a limitation, uh, in a limited way. This could be repeated itself once again with the Biden administration. And there is really a, a genuine fear that things really could go back deja vu to Obama's years, uh, to Obama's administration approach vis-a-vis -vis Iran. We could explore more with the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shaiji, for uh, th those remarks. And so, sorry, uh, I know you've got a lot to say on this topic, but I'm sure we'll come back to them in the uh, Q&A uh, session. And I also just want to encourage all the participants, if they want to post your uh, questions, please do so in the chat. Uh, and I haven't introduced the uh, panel of speakers here, uh, simply because their bios are already uh, on their website. So just to save time and to hear them speaking, I will move quickly to uh, Dr. Um, uh, uh, to Ms. Samar uh, Fatani, and she's going to be talking to us about um, uh, 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 Saudi Arabia Vision 2030, I believe, and the uh, and the future. Ms. Fatani, thank you very much. Really, thank you so much. Uh, I really am very. I have a the pleasure of uh, being in this uh, panel. And uh, uh, I wish that, first of all, to clear, I really feel that Saudi Arabia is always uh, in the news and there is a lot of misconceptions about uh, the Saudi role and uh, many of the uh, uh, media attacks on Saudi Arabia are always uh, uh, depicting it as uh, uh, an obstacle uh, to any uh, uh, progress or development. And I would like to focus on the Vision 2030 that is being implemented in Saudi Arabia uh, and the promotion of the women and the youth in order to create uh, a better environment, not only for Saudi Arabia, but uh, for the whole of the GCC. Uh, although there are many uh, conflicts or maybe uh, misunderstandings, uh, that are there and uh, GCC countries are not as uh, uh, strongly cooperated as they were in the past. But I believe that it is uh, the role of women and the youth in the region uh, who can uh, eliminate many of these obstacles. 
uh, Saudi Arabia to begin with have su has succeeded in uh, eliminating the threat of uh, terrorism uh, that was um, a major menace in the region um, and uh, marginalizing the extremists that uh, stood in the way of uh, progress and development. Uh, also uh, allowing for the 70% of the population uh, in, in, uh, in the country uh, to be able to play a bigger role. Um, they were marginal women and, and the youth were marginalized for a very long time. Uh, many of them today, uh, after raising the level of education and providing uh, scholarships uh, to very well uh, known universities across the world, whether the US or England or uh, Germany, uh, Canada, name it, all these young graduates with uh, highly qualified uh, capabilities are today uh, enjoying um, the opportunity to play a greater role uh, in, uh, in uh, developing the country and uh, providing uh, a more tolerant and modernized uh, society. Um, uh, speaking of the conflicts and the wars, the war in Yemen uh, is also an issue that is always putting Saudi Arabia uh, in the news as uh, uh, carrying out an, uh, um, a war that uh, is destroying a country and uh, uh, the Yemenis are, um, you know, complaining and uh, uh, distressed as that Saudi Arabia is an enemy uh, to, to the region. Whereas uh, the Sau Saudi Arabia has a problem with confronting uh, terrorists from a very large border uh, of its country and, um, uh, and it, that is threatening the homeland security and the peace um, uh, and security of, of the country. Uh, also our problems with Iran is another issue uh, that uh, has um, put Saudi Arabia always in the news uh, as uh, not uh, uh, being uh, um, tolerant uh, to, to relations with uh, Iran. Um, all these issues um, are, are negative and uh, uh, give a, a negative ish, ish, uh, image of, of Saudi Arabia, which the youth and most of the population here uh, do not uh, uh, support. Uh, uh, there is uh, the focus today here is uh, raising uh, the level of scientific and technological qualifications of the youth so that they'll be able to contribute uh, to uh, a more uh, developed and advanced country. Uh, also, uh, the, the, the idea that uh, the women uh, who were, um, did not enjoy equal rights um, and uh, have high qualifications are also projected uh, so that they can play a bigger role. We have women ambassadors today uh, and um, uh, the women in the leadership positions and the people of the Gulf are all the same. Uh, the, 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 the ethnic uh, 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 um, uh, qualifications or, or the way that all the Gulf people in the Gulf uh, are more closer than they are in other parts of the, the, the Arab world makes it very important for them and very uh, easy for them to uh, create uh, a more homogeneous uh, 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 society. Um, I really believe that uh, with uh, uh, concerted efforts, and uh, less um, uh, targeting of, of the region and uh, the policies uh, that are put in place, uh, in a way we can support a more peaceful uh, Gulf uh, that, can be, uh, uh, that can allow for regional uh, security and a greater degree of stability uh, in the region. The United States um, and the European Union can also play a role uh, in enhancing that role uh, so that uh, there would be a stronger GCC that, is, that would be beneficiary uh, in, in, uh, in the global arena. 
uh, and uh, will can play a bigger role in, in uh, advancing uh, uh, global security. Today, we have the threat of uh, the COVID, uh, the environmental issues, all these issues with, with the uh, GCC support uh, and uh, a stable region can also play a bigger role in creating a peaceful world today. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really wonderful. Thank you. And you've kept uh, to time and you um, made some really, very important uh, 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 points there and, and good remarks. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure there will be lots of questions from uh, the participants, uh, especially about the role of women uh, and, and the youth uh, in the region. And without much ado, let me just move on very quickly to Dr. Emma Sperier, who will be talking about uh, the whole idea of this multi-polarized Gulf region. Uh, Emma, the floor is yours, and five to seven minutes, max. <laughs> thank you, Abdullah. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening. First, I would like to thank uh, Dr. John Duke Anthony and the organizers of the Annual Policy Makers Conference for inviting me to speak at this session. It is a real honor and a genuine pleasure to be here. Among the many evolutions that the Gulf region has witnessed over the past few years, there are three key trends that are here to stay and have the potential to continuously impact uh, relations between the United States and the Gulf region. The first one is the accelerated multipolarization of its international relations in terms of Gulf countries' ties to outside power. The second one is the emergence of durable new poles of power within the region itself. And the third one is the diversification of strategic states around which regional geopolitics are organized. So with regards to my first point about the multipolarization of Gulf international relations, it has become apparent that the Gulf countries are increasingly di diversifying their strategic partnerships even in terms of military cooperation through new ties with Russia and China, but also India and, and other Asian countries. This is linked to many reasons, including, but not limited to a perceived distance towards the region on the part of the United States, arguably prompting GCC countries to look elsewhere for their security guarantees. This zero sum game approach is specifically illustrated by the rhetoric of uh, Saudi Arabia, for instance, whose leadership uh, expresses an interest in Russian systems such as the S-400 every time it feels the United States drift away. But then you have other assets worth mentioning from the perspective of the Arabian Peninsula. Of course, they lie in lesser conditionality of relations with Moscow and, and Beijing compared to Washington, at least officially. Of course, um, American arms sales to Saudi Arabia have increased exponentially over the past two administrations. That does not seem to uh, be coming to a halt or a speed bump uh, under the new administration. And to be sure, there was uh, a, a recent remark from a uh, Russian industry official, industry official saying that Saudi Arabia was no longer considering the S-400. Um, so to some extent, to this point, the multipolarization of Gulf international relations simply goes hand in hand with the undeniable multipolarization of the world. For some countries, for some Gulf countries, uh, however, this multipolarization of international relations has been a clearer and historical tactic to gain or maintain a certain level of strategic autonomy for themselves. This is particularly the case of the UAE, whose leadership sees the diversification of its partnership as a springboard, if you will, to its regional and global ambitions. And additionally, it is also worth uh, remembering that on the other shore of uh, the Persian Gulf, Iran's continued ties with Russia and China have helped the country weather the storm of the maximum pressure campaign, for instance, under the Trump administration. Whatever the reason that differ from one country to the next, in turn, this has been looked at uh, by the United States as a source of concern against the backdrop of the great power competition narrative that it has been reviving. 
The second trend happening in Gulf geopolitics also represents at times a challenge to the regional order that the United States has been counting on over the past decades. The second trend, namely the multipolarization of the Gulf region itself, is arguably the most important change in geopolitical dynamics of Arabia and the Gulf in the past 30 to 40 years. In terms of uh, the Gulf regional security complex as we used to know it, one of the effects of the creation of the GCC in 81 was indeed a certain consolidation of the Saudi pole within a regional triangle of power with Iran and Iraq. And then after 91, and especially after the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, this triangle has largely been reduced to a bipolar opposition between Riyadh and Tehran. Ever since the early 2000s, however, um, the smaller GCC countries have been pulling their weight as independent actors. And we often think, of course, of Kuwait and Oman in that respect. But today, the point I want to emphasize is how both Qatar and the UAE have been on an upward trajectory of increased regional and global visibility and power with the past decade consolidating um, they're emerging as, as new distinct poles within the Gulf region. Now, why did I say that this could represent a challenge at times? Because as was made pretty clear during the Trump administration, for instance, this increased plurality of voices and stances and interests within the Arabian Peninsula has made it uh, that much more difficult to build a united front against a designated enemy be it Iran or China. At the same time, this plurality of actors uh, and approaches can also represent an asset, as was illustrated since the US withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan. So overall, this multipolarization of the Gulf region and its international relations could actually be a vessel for more peace and stability, moving away from oppositional strategies against the chosen target. One aspect that could help embrace this growing fluidity, if you will, of the geopolitical dynamics of the Gulf uh, could be the last trend I mentioned, uh, that is the diversification of strategic stakes around which uh, regional geopolitics are organized. What I'm talking about here, and I know I don't have much time anymore, but is the fact that uh, new dimensions of human security linked to health, of course, but also food and water scarcity and environmental challenges have become increasingly central in domestic politics, but also reshaping international relations of the Gulf countries. And you have numerous examples, of course, of cooperation with China in this respect, but we can go back uh, to this in the Q&A. The global context over the past few years between the continuing pandemic and the repeated and dramatic manifestation of the impact of global warming has not only been a call to leaders everywhere to seriously reconsider uh, their priorities and their definition of national security, but it has also been a call to further and better cooperate to address said challenges. The question today is whether the United States and other traditional allies of the Gulf countries will step up and answer this call or stick to narratives and self-fulfilling prophecies of ever increasing military insecurities and weaponized power competition. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. That was uh, a great intervention, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions from uh, the floors as they are started to, uh, to come, and I'll come back to you uh, in, a, in a minute or so in the Q&A. And uh, now we've heard from the region, we've heard from Europe, we now want to hear from the United States. And, mm -hmm. you know, last but not least uh, speaker is Ambassador Retired Anne Peterson, who's going to give us a uh, US view on how to see the, uh, the shifting dynamics of, of geopolitics in the region. Thank you so much, Dr. Babu. And thank you for uh, Dr. Anthony for inviting me to speak at this seminar, which is one of the highlights of, of, the, of US Arab relations. And also I wanna mention 
uh, Dr. Anthony's intern program, uh, which is absolutely the best in Washington and has instructed many generations of, of American and Arab scholars over the years. But first on the GCC, uh, I think every, the GCC itself, I think everyone is relieved that the rift between Qatar and the UAE has ended, but I personally think it will take a while for the scars to heal. I'd always thought the successes of the GCC were more economic than strategic in nature, and, and they were largely small and incremental, but nonetheless useful. And I'm afraid these efforts at cooperation are gonna be hard to restore as Qatar in particular looks to, to, to position itself as a platform for the big markets like India and Pakistan and others in the GCC compete to be really the headquarters of the broader Middle East. The economic rupture I think is particularly unfortunate. Uh, some of the Gulf countries, particularly Qatar and the UAE and Saudi Arabia have made very significant steps toward economic modernization that would have been aided by a more effective customs union. But most people on this call are concerned about the geopolitical future of the US of the, and GCC relations and, and Iran and the Gulf's role in great power competition. First, the US. Uh, daily, we see articles arguing that the US should withdraw not only from the Gulf, but from the broader Middle East. Much of the US discussion focuses on an overly technical discussion, in my view, of the US bases in the Gulf or the Patriot missiles and when they should be taken out and what the signaling of that is. But I suspect some of the discussion will die down now because we have seen, certainly with the use of al Udaid, how these bases have pro proven to be an enormous strategic asset to the United States during the evacuation of, uh, of Afghanistan. But it's hardly a secret that the Gulf countries are concerned about American commitment. This predates the Biden administration, of course, but I think it got a lot more serious when the Trump administration failed to protect the Saudi oil processing plant from an Iranian attack. Despite all the warm visits between the Trump administration and the Saudis, this went to the core of the relationship, which is the US defense umbrella so that these countries in the Gulf can export oil and natural gas. And then the much publicized back and forth on American arms sales to the Gulf and the withdrawal of the Patriots were read as another sign of waning US commitment and prompted visits by Gulf leaders uh, to other arms producing countries, particularly in China and Russia to fill in the gaps. I think also the American withdrawal from Afghanistan encouraged Gulf leaders to whisper a little more loudly uh, their concerns about US commitment and about America's messy withdrawal. Uh, and as we saw during Saudi Arabia's 10 year, very difficult battle against extremism, the Gulf countries and particularly Saudi Arabia are far more vulnerable to extremists than the US and Europe. And the growing presence of ISIS and the reputed resurgence of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan um, must cause Gulf leaders some concern. On Iran and Syria, of course, there have been warming signs between the Gulf and Syria. There have been discussions, I think not very serious, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. There have been discussions between Turkey and Egypt and other states with reciprocal grievances. Um, I think Dr. Abdullah hit on an important point. I think it's more the uncertainty that, about what the US is doing with the JCPOA, because I think everyone anticipated that the US would re-enter the uh, Iranian nuclear agreement pretty quickly. And that would in turn enable better relations or better leverage uh, in Yemen and Iraq. And that hasn't taken place. Um, Relations between the Gulf countries and Russia have been warming ever since the Russians uh, supported the Assad regimes, and Gulf countries generally decide that they need to hedge their bets. But here I think things haven't changed all that much, uh, and I think I want to make this, I think there's less as, as multipolarity as, as than people think, because the core of the relationship with the U.S., pretty much remains the same as it always has been, and that's energy and the U.S. protection of that energy. I looked at oil prices this morning, it was $80 a barrel. And despite all the talk about a change relationship with Saudi Arabia on human rights, 
When push comes to shove on energy prices and gasoline prices are at $4 a barrel and in, in the $4 a gallon in the United States, the Biden administration had to pick up the phone and call Riyadh and ask the Saudis to raise production because of U.S. gasoline prices. Uh, they raised production modestly, but fundamentally refused. As U.S. domestic production is under pressure and environmental regulations are gonna kick in in a big way, it's really gonna end up bolstering the position of Gulf countries, uh, particularly I think Saudi Arabia and the natural gas behemoth cutter. So I think, I think the fundamental relationship uh, between the U.S. and the Gulf countries which is about energy above all else, is not going to be that fundamentally changed because I think the Gulf countries are going to be in a stronger position on energy in the coming years than they have been in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. That was uh, very, very timely and also very succinct and uh, up to the point. And uh, you've raised a number of very important issues. And, and let me start with you. Um, uh, if I may, uh, Ambassador, and after Al Ola uh, agreement, there has been some kind of a reconciliation between the Gulf states, and I think this has been also welcomed by uh, uh, the United States. Do you see this is going any further? Do you think that you know that the, the damage because of the uh, conflict uh, is over, or the stains are still there? And what future do you see for the GCC as a regional organization? Well, I think, I think the U.S. pushed reconciliation extremely hard, and not just because of the, the threat from Iran, because it disrupted enormous, uh, enormous amount of trade and, and uh, an enormous amount of trade in the Gulf. But, but I do think it's taken its toll on the GCC. And, and when you talk particularly to cutteries, what they talk about is not so much the trade or the economics, they talk about family reunification. Uh, and that that was one of the, the most significant costs that they paid uh, for, for three and a half years. Um, so I, I think it'll take a while. I think there are lots of promising signs. I think it's in everybody's interest. That's perhaps the most important point to, to continue the process of reconciliation and to restore the GCC. But I don't think we should underestimate how difficult that's gonna be. Totally agree with you. And, and, let, me, and let me move to uh, Emma, to Europe. And um, Emma, what can Europe do in, in this regard, and also in terms of supporting U.S. policy in, in the region, given the fact that there, are, there is competition from other uh, international powers, as it were, in the Gulf region. There is international, thank you, there is international competition, but it can be argued, obviously, that the potentialities of um, U.S. European conversions when it comes to how uh, how do we help the region move towards uh, more stability and security are higher now than they were during the past four years, uh, and I, I will say that uh, the European powers in this in this regard have really, with a lot of other actors, but have really contributed uh, maintaining a careful balance uh, within the region so that we didn't. Um, go in, into a, a full-on opposition. The European powers didn't really subscribe to the maximum pressure uh, campaign and this approach and try to maintain uh, some somewhat uh, successful uh, uh, balance within, within the region. And, it, and European powers also uh, maintained a careful balance when it came to uh, the, the GCC crisis, um, the, the Gulf crisis. And so what, I'm, what I mean by this is that uh, European powers and, in, in, um, of course, France, uh, France among, amongst them has been seen as a credible actor when it comes to, you know, uh, perhaps uh, su supporting, uh, if not sponsoring, a regional com communication and cooperation in a way that uh, for a couple of years, the United States were, were perhaps less seen as a credible a uh, sponsor for such uh, regional coordination and uh, and dialogue, and so 
I, I would argue that there is a lot uh, to, to, be, to be taken from constant dialogue be between the United States and European powers when it comes to, well, what is, what is the next phase? Uh, and I will say that I do agree with uh, Ambassador Patterson that, uh, that it will probably take a, a lot of time to mend the, 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 the harm that has been done by, by this crisis. Thank you, um, Emma. And, and now let's um, go to uh, another perspective, and that is from Fatin, if I, uh, from Samar Fatni, if I may ask you, Samar, you talked about Vision 2030 and the role of women. And of course, we all know that Saudi Arabia is the most significant country in the Gulf region and the Arabian Peninsula. And what happens in that country can affect the whole region. And we are everybody, the whole world is watching what's going on in Saudi Arabia. Just wanted to ask you, do you see that the leadership now in Saudi Arabia and also the opening of the space for people and young people in particular and women is going to reverberate around the region and it's going to create a different environment? Yes, I believe so. Um, that's why I, uh, I really am focusing on uh, promoting people-to-people uh, -people relations. Uh, the youth in the Gulf have seen what has happened all around them, whether in Syria, Libya, Iraq, and, and elsewhere. Um, and the main concern today is promoting stability and security. Uh, no one wants to see wars. No one wants to see the, con the continued conflicts although there could be uh, conflicts between uh, GCC countries, but the people and the youth in all of the region um, support one another in, in working towards uh, developing their countries, uh, working towards uh, uh, um, you know, technological advances and uh, uh, working towards uh, contributing towards uh, a more prosperous uh, society. All these issues, I think, can play a bigger role in eliminating many of the conflicts that are going on. Of course, there are countries have their own self-interest and uh, their economic uh, issues and, uh, and political issues as well. However, if we have a stronger base of people who are uh, determined and concerned in creating a peaceful environment, I think we will see um, a better uh, better chances of creating peace and stability and security to the region. Um, um, Ambassador uh, um, Anne was talking about the uh, the issue of now uh, the more um, threatening uh, uh, issues of uh, the terrorism and uh, what's happened in Afghanistan and how it could be uh, another a surge of uh, terrorist attacks and so on. These are major concerns and issues that we really should focus on rather than focus on conflicts that are uh, sh should not take the priority. What we need now is a more uh, stable region, a more secure region and allowing uh, the people of the region to help create a better environment and a peaceful uh, society so that we can develop and prosper uh, uh, in a very uh, 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 secure environment. Thank you, uh, Samar, for that. And let me uh, move on to Dr. Shaiji and ask uh, Dr. Shaiji this question that has been raised by so many people. That and has been mentioned here in this uh, in this talk, there is a de-escalation going on in the region. Uh, there seems to be, you know, calming down of all the conflicts uh, 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 and the crisis in, in the region. We are seeing that, you know, whether it's the Gulf crisis or whether the dialogue with uh, Iran or even the war in Yemen, etc. I want to ask you: To what extent do you see this as a fundamental change in the perception? of the leaderships here in the region that they want to de-escalate and move on to what the other speakers have talked about, you know, more peaceful region, or is this just a tactical issue because of the changes in, um, in leadership in the United States and the vision of the United States towards the region? Dr. Shaiji. 
well hopefully we we have uh, we are hopeful. thank you uh, thank you my friend uh, dr babu uh, well i think what sparked uh, this de-escalation in the first place was the flip-flopping of the uh, trump administration by not doing anything uh, after the iranians launched a, a massive attack on the saudis uh, aramco uh, oil installations back in September 2019, that was a wake up call for all the GCC countries led by Saudi Arabia and UAE. And since then, we have seen major, major shift uh, in the approach vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And that, that that was the cause of the escalation. Then he, Trump upped the ante again, and uh, he almost uh, pulled the region into a, a war after he assassinated uh, Qasem Soleimani. The uh, the head of the Quds uh, uh, Battalion, and uh, the other uh, shift came after the uh, President Biden won the election, and that uh, really uh, uh, shook the region and shook those who uh, were there, and that caused, in my opinion, a, a chain reaction that resulted in the escalation that started as a as as a, a way to rethink and revisit the crises in the region and because of that we, we to a large extent in my opinion we've seen the reconciliation with qatar which i agree with uh, ambassador peterson that the scars have not healed yet and there are no ambassadors from uae or Bahrain in Qatar or, or, or the other way around. But the lesson is clear now. The GCC, have their, uh, they have to get their act together. And uh, But because of the independence and the project, uh, the Qatari project, uh, grandiose project, the UAE, even UAE, in my opinion now, is rethinking. It's uh, overextending its presence in many places. And it's revisiting that. And, now there are talks of a visit, uh, of a high profile visit uh, to Turkey. We've seen reconciliation with the Iranians. We've seen the, the Saudis and the Iranians held uh, not very substantial, but at least uh, broke the ice uh, in, in Iraq between the Saudis and the Iranians. So this chain reaction of a strategic from a tactical uh, position at this stage but I'm fearful that some people in the decision-making apparatus in some countries are harking back to probably Trump will come again and things will go back to where they were. And this is probably banking on illusion, in my opinion, because the issue of uh, not really getting our act together is very costly uh, for all of us. If you allow me, I just need to raise another point, and that is, the value of GCC full uh, bloom with the uh, with the aid and assistance of the United States uh, to save President Biden's uh, uh, face value approach by the hectic withdrawal from Afghanistan. But one of the Qataris who chipped in and evacuated over 70,000 Americans and Afghani uh, families and, and personnel Biden would have looked really terrible, uh, even much worse than he's now being uh, by the, not only the, the Republicans in the, in the Congress, but even by the Democrats. This, uh, this hasty withdrawal was really very, very damaging to the perception of the United States as the protector or as the country that provides security to its GCC allies. So we've proven once uh, time and again time and again that GCC as allies are very valuable assets and could really chip in when push comes to shove and help the Americans without costing them a penny, unlike other allies of the United States. So that's some hit in the United States, not only among the Democrats, but about US establishment and even think tanks like uh, Dr. John Anthony's uh, think tank or, or council that uh, the value of GCC as a really reliable partners, even at the time of this retrenchment, and even at a time when the Russians and even the Chinese have signed, the Chinese signed really 25 year contract uh, or, or, or strategic treaty 
with the Iranians to pump in Dr. Shaki, billion let dollars. Me, so let who's me press you on this point. Vacuum on United States retrenching? Go let ahead. me press you on this point, and please be very brief because we're running out of time. What would you advise or okay. recommend to the U.S. president about ways to strengthen relations and expand greater relations and address common threats in the Gulf? And please be very brief because we only have very few moments left. Well, first of all, to take the concern, uh, the concerns of the of the GCC partners, as they have proven time and again, that are very reliable. And the last one was uh, the Afghanistan debacle. The second point is that to take to allay the uh, the GCC fears, uh, whether it is officials or pop or people or or thinkers like us, that we believe United States is starting to pull out of the region. Not gonna, not gonna withdraw completely. But what are the United States' comprehensive strategy to the region? I know it had been downgraded uh, in favor of China and Russia and other parts of the world. Uh, but also not to lose sight that the GCC is still very uh, reliable, very indispensable regarding the energy. Maybe not to the United States, but to the world economy. And e and and also the last point is that to take the concern of the GCC regarding Iran in destabilizing activities and its shenanigans uh, regarding now with the seventh round of, of discussion and negotiations in, in Vienna, to take the, the concern of the GCC regarding the Iranians' uh, behavior of destabilizing the region, its ballistic missile and its drones, that are attacking on a daily basis the Saudis. Thank you. Very important point, uh, Professor Shaggy. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Let me move very quickly again uh, to uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Ann Peterson and ask her the same question. What would you recommend to the U.S. president? And what about the war in Yemen? So, so on the U.S. relations, communication is broken down because there aren't that many people to talk to. Many of the countries, the Gulf countries, are without American ambassadors. There's no one heading the Middle East Department now. Let me give you a specific example. Uh, a Kuwaiti friend I, talked about the withdrawal of the Patriot missiles. He's a businessman, I know, and and I think I think the impact of that has been has been exaggerated in the Gulf as a as a really big sign of American lack of commitment. But who's talking about it? Who's explaining to the Kuwaiti public or the Saudi public what it means and what 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 is still viable and and important in the relationship? So that that's that's desperately needed right now. And of course, the whole Iran thing uh, plays into it. And on Yemen, it's extremely grim. And I don't think we can put any other uh, uh, cast on it. And and there's a question in the chat. I think I think. Um, I think Iranian influence is normally in these situations is probably less as the Houthis have gotten stronger, and and I would I would suggest that the the end game, as it were, is going to be very very sad for the Yemeni people as the country fractures. Thank you, Ambassador. That was very very uh, helpful. And let's move to uh, summer uh, now and see what would you recommend from a Saudi perspective. What do you want the United States to do? Or well, I think I think the United States can really play a bigger role in trying to defuse uh, the the conflicts uh, and uh, the the struggles uh, in the region. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are at a standstill with all the issues that we have been discussing so far. Um, uh, maybe uh, there are some. Um, not ma not major uh, progress that is uh, being done in the region, whether it's uh, with the Iranian issue, with the Yemeni issue, and uh, with the, the conflicts uh, uh, between uh, regional uh, uh, countries. It's up to the United States whether it really wants to play a bigger role in trying to defuse these conflicts and trying to play a bigger role in uh, helping the region overcome the challenges that it's facing today. Thank you. That's really helpful again, uh, Samar. And let's move very quickly again to Emma. And what would you, from a European perspective, uh, advise the United States, but from also from your own perspective, advise the President of the United States to do? 
I would say two things. Uh, one that is arguably already uh, being done, which is encourage uh, regional dialogue that would address all the challenges that they face collectively so that they can prioritize specific measures to address them. And then again, collectively without having unilateral demands. And the second and perhaps most important is uh, try and move away from zero sum game approaches. Because as we've seen uh, throughout this, this conference uh, and this session, this is not working in the region and that only adds up to tensions. Uh, so that will be it for me, thank you. So more dialogue and more inclusion uh, and inclusiveness in the region, uh, hopefully that is something that you would recommend to uh, the president of the United States and more involvement and taking the consideration of uh, the Gulf states uh, fears and apprehension about uh, the, the perceived withdrawal from the United States from the region and be more open. I think those are the open, the, ma the main points that were raised here. And uh, uh, given, of course, uh, time scale, we, uh, I would like to just now hand it over to uh, Dr. John Duke Anthony um, to say a few words before we end this uh, uh, great session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abdullah, and all three of our uh, resource specialists. Each of you came uh, with complementary uh, views, bouncing off of each other, uh, adding uh, to the uh, foundation of uh, still altogether uh, limited American knowledge about the GCC region, for example. But we've gone some distance since uh, the administration of President George H.W. Bush when he referred to the Gulf Cooperation Council and a number in the media and the American public writ large uh, thought surely he was talking about the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so uh, the GCC is not exactly a household name, but we don't at least have that abysmal level of ignorance that was on parade uh, uh, less than a quarter of a century ago. Uh, point two, is that uh, people realize that the GCC is also something more than animal, vegetable, or mineral. Uh, there, it's, a, it's a phenomenon uh, worthy of serious study and uh, greater communication at all levels. The absence of an ambassador is, uh, hopefully this is a more clinical, detached, and objective perspective, uh, really inexcusable and optically and percept perceptively uh, irresponsible that if you're serious about something, then you show that you're serious about something. And if you're serious about something, you engage, you're involved. Uh, democracy is not a spectator sport. Uh, if you want results, you have to play, you have to be engaged, you have to be involved. If you don't play, you're not engaged, you're not involved, then who do you have to blame uh, for shortcomings, limitations, failures, ineffectiveness? One has to look in the mirror and see that these are largely self-inflicted wounds. And at the emotional, psychological, and therefore also by extension political level of individuals, uh, ponder the fact that on no other corner of the globe has the United States have been centrally involved, pivotally in, involved in killing more Arabs and Muslims, wounding more Arabs and Muslims, making more Arab and Muslims refugees, making uh, more Arab and Muslim widows, making more Arab and Muslim orphans, making more Muslim and Arab domestically displaced people uh, in Iraq in particular, uh, but elsewhere too, Afghanistan, case in point, Yemen uh, indirectly, uh, Syria uh, indirectly, uh, but there's no other country <clears throat> that bears that image, that, that reputation. Um, and so it begs the question of these are people who we refer to as their friends, as their allies, as their partners. And you can ask the question, why provoke a partner when you can avoid provoking a partner? Why alienate, why antagonize an ally when you are in control of policies and positions or actions? or attitudes at the governmental level, not necessarily the think tank, public policy research institutes, 
and uh, media and special interest groups uh, perspectives, uh, which include those who want to continue to see Arabs and Muslims as those, as them, as other, uh, wide mental, so to speak, versus what all four of you have underscored that there's uh, an extraordinary degree of usness, weeness in this relationship, uh, where we are joined at the hip. Uh, it's a Catholic kind of marriage with no divorce. Uh, one would be hard pressed to name six other geographically contiguous countries that, despite uh, three major international conflicts in this region in the last three and a half decades, have nonetheless re remained stable and secure. Uh, ordinarily, one thinks that if there's regional insecurity, that there's bound to be domestic insecurity among the states that live in the region. No, the GCC is an outstanding example of the exact opposite. And you have had death on their doorstep on more years than not. And yet here you find the GCC as a country that many unemployed Arabs and Muslims elsewhere, and even Westerners and Easterners and Northerners and Southerners who are not Arab and not Muslim, uh, would love to have a chance to live and work in one or more of the GCC countries. Just go to any of the embassies in uh, many countries and you will find that the lines of those wanting to be allowed to go to live and work in the GCC region are longer than the lines in front of any other uh, embassy of where people would like to have a visa to go live and work. And the other way around, in terms of the United States being the recipient of GCC interest and engagement and involvement, despite the tensions, despite the antagonism, despite the alienation, despite the provocation, despite the emotional wounds and the shattering to smithereens of the dreams of tens of thousands of Iraqis and Afghanis and Syrians and others, uh, that the lands of non-Arab, non-Muslim embassies in uh, these countries are uh, greatest in front of the American embassy. Uh, and Ambassador Patterson knows this well. When she served in Riyadh, when she served in Egypt, when she served elsewhere, uh, there are more than a million uh, graduates of American universities in the GCC region. These are people who spent their most formative years of their upbringing, the most impressionistic years of open-mindedness, of wanting to do things differently than the generation before them, and to get the toolkits that would enable them to make a profound, enduring, if at all possible, comprehensive difference in the reform-oriented dynamics of all of these countries that have uh, been nonstop on the road to modernization and development. Uh, a more remarkable story of success of having stability and domestic security in the midst of a region fraught with this kind of, two kinds of oil, turmoil, and that other kind uh, that they have endured and thrived more than survived uh, but set an example uh, for the rest of the developing world, the emerging economies, and those much further afield. We have a great deal to learn from these societies and their emphasis on the family, on culture, on society, and the sinews, the glue, the lubricant, the adhesive that has held these polities and populaces uh, together domestically uh, from 1981 straight through uh, to the present day. And Dr. Bob Oob, you've been terrific in choreographing as we predicted you were and concerning uh, these uh, four resource specialists, each of whom has brought a unique and much valued, more than valued, treasured uh, set of perspectives to enhance our knowledge, our understanding, our information, our insight, and our capacity for sounder, wiser analysis than what otherwise have been the case had not you and your 
colleagues uh, contributed what you've done for the past hour. Thank you, sir. And thank you, each of the resource specialists, Sama Fatani, Emma Subrie, Abdullah Shaiji, and Ambassador Patterson. All the best to everyone.